Hello everyone, um, back for uh, part the part four video for the module on the informal fallacies for the critical reasoning class online. Um, I know I said that I was going to probably make like five of these videos, but I'm actually thinking maybe I can just kind of get all the rest of the fallacies done here in one video. So this might be a longer one, but we'll see how it goes. We'll, I'll check in again about this at the end of the video and let you know whether there's a part five coming or not. But Maybe we can get them all done right now. Let's see. We'll see how it goes. All right. Um, so we got more fallacies to do. That's pretty much the game. So let's get at it. Um, now we're looking at the fallacies that are in the sufficiency principle from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, um, which, if you remember, when I was talking about this, was sort of like um, the principle is reminding us that just because we have something to say in defense of our position doesn't mean we have a good enough argument um, to justify believing in our conclusion and that's what sufficiency is sort of pointing out and the first fallacy that we've got to talk about that is sort of guilty of violating this I actually think is violating some other things too um, and that's arguing from ignorance so again um, you know I mentioned at the beginning of these videos that um, I appreciate that that um, Edward Damer the guy who wrote this the this this the book that we're taking some selections from here I appreciate that he's trying to put the fallacies under these principles from the Code of Intellectual Conduct to try to not only organize them, but also help to explain um, what makes the fallacy a fallacy, like why it's a problem. Um, I just think that there's uh, maybe a little bit more to the explanation for these fallacies than, than the categories that he chooses. So I'll explain what I mean here with arguing from ignorance as we go. But arguing from ignorance is actually fairly common. Um, we do this quite a bit. Here's the definition Edward gives us. Arguing for the truth or falsity of a claim because there is no evidence or proof to the contrary or because of the inability or refusal of an opponent to present convincing evidence to the contrary. The second version is kind of like um, trying to shove the burden of proof onto your opponent rather than taking responsibility for defending your own position. Um, so that, that would be a problem too. But the first part... Um, happens well <laughs> I guess the second one happens quite a bit too that they're like well prove me wrong sort of thing that would definitely be the second version and that happens all the time but the first version also happens a lot when you say the fact that there's no evidence that I'm wrong is a reason to think that I'm right and that's a problem um, and the reason why it's a problem is because of this point here that basically having no evidence on the issue works equally for both sides of a debate. The fact that there's no evidence against it or for it, both sides could use the same argument that is um, arguing from ignorance here. So it's kind of like they offset. And this also brings in from the Code of Intellectual Conduct the suspension of judgment principle. That there's another option here on the table, that, and the, it's a better option to remain agnostic on the issue. If there's no evidence one way or the other, then we don't have reason to prefer one of those beliefs over the other. This word agnostic, maybe you've heard this word before in the context of um, religious or theological debates. To be agnostic uh, in a religious context would be to not have a belief one way or the other about God's existence. So you're not an atheist, one who believes God does not exist, and you're not a theist, someone who believes God does exist, but agnostic means you're like, I don't have a belief either way. And and usually the stronger version of agnosticism would positively argue that we don't have good enough reason to believe one way or the other. Okay, that's what it would mean to be agnostic. But <clears throat> this word agnostic doesn't only have its use in the religious context when we're talking about belief in God. Um, we could also um, talk about the same dynamic showing up on any debate for or against something. The third option would be to um, not commit. And this isn't, I did want to say this about being agnostic and the suspension of judgment principle. This isn't actually like a, a weak position in the sense that you're like a fence sitter who's not willing to take sides. An agnostic position on an issue is taking a side, and it also requires argument to defend. You can't just be like, well, I, I don't know, so I guess I'm agnostic. That's not what it means to be an agnostic. That is what that would be is to be confused. <laughs> to be agnostic is to believe that there isn't a good enough argument here one way or the other to believe either way. And if the, we don't have evidence on the matter, if we really are ignorant, then 
there that the the fact that ignorance could be brought up by both sides for or against as a reason why the other one's wrong means they kind of offset so where we're actually at is we should remain uncommitted on the issue because there's not enough uh, evidence to go either way to make that claim about a situation is to make a positive claim to say there isn't enough evidence here or we don't have the evidence to, that would speak one way or the other that's also a position that also requires defense and you could be right or wrong about that too um, so it's not just this uh, wishy-washy thing um, sometimes it, 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 gain, it gets that uh, that misconception or that image surrounding it and that's not what it actually means um, and I say this is connected with the fallacy of false alternatives, since oftentimes agnosticism can be left out of our considerations of which position, you know, what, if we, if we have a situation that calls for a judgment in response, you know, you could agree with the claim, you could think the claim is false, or there's always agnosticism, and it's easy to forget that. I mentioned here in the lecture notes that even um, in professional philosophy, I've seen uh, it, that option getting forgotten about. Um, that we're so eager to to get to some kind of determinate conclusion about it that we might not recognize that we have insufficient evidence to draw a conclusion. That's incidentally why arguing from ignorance shows up under the sufficiency principle. Um, now, there's some other wrinkles here, some other wrinkles to be careful about. At this point, this is pretty much all you need to know in terms of preparing for the exam, for being able to detect arguing from ignorance. You should be listening for one of those two things happening either someone trying to shove the burden of proof onto their opponent or someone citing a lack of evidence as a reason why they're right okay but there's some wrinkles here there's some exceptions or caveats to um, the idea that you should remain agnostic on an issue that doesn't have any evidence for it so this is a little complicated so that's why I'm like pay attention or I guess that's not what I really mean I look out <laughs> Okay, so this is a little subtle. So let's talk about it. So I'm saying it gets harder when the argument that we're having is over what we should do and not necessarily about what we should believe. And the reason for this is because usually when we have a debate about actions, there's there's sort of a way in which our we're we're forced to do something. Even doing nothing is a choice, right? That would need to be defended. So there when we're talking about action, usually there's no way around claiming an answer, right? You can't be agnostic and not act um, because inaction is an action, right? So in these sorts of situations, there might be other practical concerns that would um, push in some direction. That isn't a matter of empirical evidence. So what I'm saying here is that in a situation in which we don't have evidence whether something is true or false there could still be arguments made about what we should believe is true or false or how we should act as if something was true or false if we don't have evidence one way or the other I mean this actually applies straight over into um, the religion debate a lot of times the debate kind of devolves into this thing about is there empirical evidence for God or not for God and and there are some apologists who try to show that there's empirical evidence for God's existence, and there's other people who are trying to show there isn't any empirical evidence for God's existence. And, and for, at least for my money here, there isn't definitive proof one way or the other. Whether God exists or not is, is in principle the kind of thing that no amount of experiential evidence or observation would ever be able to prove one way or the other. It wouldn't work either way. But in that situation, there still could be reasons why to adopt a belief one way or the other as well, whether it be whether this would be the most rationally defensible position even if we can't have proof that it's true or false right there's still room for that um, and I'm not even speaking as a theist right now you know that I am religious but um, I'm not trying to make any apologetic discussions right now on one side or the other I think these considerations go both ways a lot of times um, people who uh, object against belief in God are saying it's not rational to believe in this okay sure yeah we can't use argument from ignorance here because we could never have definitive proof that an infinite being doesn't exist. I mean, you couldn't have that kind of proof that you're looking for, that science is always asking for, to prove a claim. But it isn't consistent with rational principles to endorse this sort of belief. That's the, a, a very common argument about it. And that's, that's what I'm kind of talking about. It's that kind of argument, an argument that is appealing to other sorts of considerations 
about what sort of belief we should adopt, um, that might be sort of still a way for us to proceed even if we don't have definitive evidence one way or the other. Okay. So that, that's a little limitation on um, recognizing arguing from ignorance as a fallacy. Like you can't argue that way, um, but there are other things that you could do instead, even in situations where we do lack evidence, where we are in a state of ignorance. Okay, there's still arguments that can be made. And again, like I was saying a second ago, this is especially potent as an especially potent point when we're considering decisions about what what we should do, right? When we're we're thinking about action, because you got to act somehow. And if I don't have enough evidence or argument to act on, then how else am I going to make the decision? So let me give you an example. I like this example a lot. I came up with this one. So I know that my housemate who is moving out needs to be let into our house today to pick up the rest of his stuff, some of which is very important to him. So the stakes are high here. I don't have any evidence that he still has his house keys, but I also don't have any evidence that he doesn't have his house keys. In this case, I, you know, I, I'm saying Tim Linneman, I, um, in this case, I should stay at home to make sure he can get in, but why is that the justified response? So what argument would I give for saying why we should err on that side? It's not for the reason that I have no evidence that he does have his keys, so I should assume, assume he doesn't. That would be arguing from ignorance, but rather because the costs of me staying around unnecessarily do not outweigh the costs of him showing up and not being able to get his stuff. That's the reason, okay? So, because if I choose one option and I'm wrong versus if I choose the other option and I'm wrong, the kind of costs are different, right? The risk is higher on one side. So it's just prudent to take one of those responses over the other, okay? That's still, that's still a rational appeal. It's not on the basis of evidence. It's more, on an, it's more like an ethical argument. It's a normative argument about the stakes involved in the decision one way or the other. Okay? So there's still that kind of argument that can be made, even if the argument is not settled based on direct empirical evidence, whether or not my housemate has his keys or not. I don't have any evidence either way. But I could still make a decision about what to do, what, I, what sort of decision I should make with behavior as if I, a certain belief had been adopted. Okay, um, <clears throat> it is uh, a principle of taking the option with the least risk of harm, that's kind of what I was just saying, that justifies my choice of action in this matter. In this example, I still am not justified, whoa, what just happened? Don't do that. <laughs> in this example, I still am not justified in saying I know that he doesn't have his keys, just that this choice is the best choice to make. Okay. And then I also bring up issues of faith, and I don't necessarily mean religious faith here. For example, I don't have evidence my partner is cheating on me, but I also don't have evidence my partner is not cheating on me, so why do I continue to believe that they're not cheating on me? I probably take that on faith. I may not have any direct evidence about this, so I'm in a state of ignorance, but I, I am going to adopt a certain belief. Um, but what we so there might be some ways to, to defend that belief as rational, as appropriate, as what I should do. But again, whatever we defend, it's not going to be about absence of evidence. We can't do things that way. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the bottom line of what I'm arguing for with like introducing the subtlety here, this little like caveat, this little asterisk to the discussion of arguing from ignorance. Arguing from ignorance is a fallacy, and I just don't want it to teach the wrong message, to take for you to take the wrong message away from it. So I think this is a nice way of summing it up. We shouldn't interpret this fallacy and the rule of thumb I gave above as saying that in cases where there is no evidence one way or the other, we are unjustified in believing either one. It's only to say that we are not justified if we merely cite the absence of evidence as the proof that something is true, as a reason for believing it. Okay, believing the opposite. This kind of sums it all up. Appealing to an absence of evidence is not evidence. That's not providing an argument for anything. But even in a case where we don't have evidence one way or the other, there is maybe the option of making a different style of argument to defend a position. So that, that kind of sums it all up. Um, that's kind of related to my suggestion about what to do when people use this fallacy against you. Um, I think that I, I haven't been talking about these in, in as much detail as, as I um, maybe would like for the sake of time. Um, 
and I, and I encourage you to read my lecture notes anyway, but I did say that most of my suggestions having to, are having to do with charity, and I think charity is good here. So you can make it clear that you're like, I'm not buying this argument. You're, the lack of evidence is not evidence. I, I can't do that. But I'm guessing you probably have some other reasons why you're going on this side versus the other. Because remember, if it's just the absence of evidence, that argument works equally for both sides. So if, if the person you're talking to is more sympathetic to one of those sides than the other, then there's probably some other reasons going on here. And if you use some charity to, to try to help figure out or articulate what are the motives behind their position, and saying you're willing to take those considerations seriously, even if you're not accepting this arguing from ignorance, um, then I think that helps a lot. Uh, I think arguing from ignorance is one of those fallacies that I've witnessed being abused a little more often, that's like people just kind of, if they see you making the mistake, then they just toss your argument in the trash so fast. So I, I don't think that's right. Of course, any of these fallacies, I don't think that's appropriate, but especially this one I see get used as a like, gotcha. And I don't think that's the right way to do it. So I'm warning against that. Okay, but let's move on. Another fallacy. Fallacy of popular wisdom. This one's a little more straightforward than arguing from ignorance. So here's the definition Edward gives us. Appealing to insights expressed in aphorisms or cliches, folk wisdom, or so-called common sense, instead of to relevant evidence for a claim. This is kind of like uh, using sound bites as an argument. And I, I think that's a good like modern version. It'd be kind of like... Um, trying to carry out an argument using tweets, you know, where your like word choice, your character limit is so short that trying to just throw out these little sayings as a way of of uh, of arguing your point where you're like, well, you know, watch pot never boils and stuff like that. That's that's the kind of uh, arguing style that this fallacy is talking about and saying that's inappropriate. Now what's problematic about that? And again, I think the response to this fallacy is charity. Because there may be a good argument in the area, just not the way that it's worded with these cliche folk saying kinds of things. The, prob the problem is twofold. One, um, usually these catchphrases have this kind of rhetorical jingle to them that make them uh, attractive. They're maybe a, a witticism um, and they sound good. And so we generally don't critically reflect on whether or not they actually are saying something that is true or insightful or has wisdom to it. Um, we just kind of unreflectively accept them because it sounds nice. Um, and, and, and as a deeper point here, oftentimes people accept them without knowing why they would be right, even if they are right. So that's a problem, um, that we're not sort of thinking critically about these things. And this, I mean, I might also put this point in a different way. If you're trying to decide, like, okay, sh couldn't I use these things? Um, maybe I shouldn't. Why? One reason is that if you use them, maybe you know what's going on. Maybe you're able to use that catchphrase or something in a meaningful way. I mean, sometimes I use catchphrases in my lectures all the time to be like, help make a point or something. But it's generally dangerous because even if you know what you're talking about with using it, speaking that way doesn't encourage your audience to think critically about what you're saying. And that's the deeper concern here. This is why I've talked, when we talked about the Code of Intellectual Conduct before, and at various points during the course of this quarter, I've been saying that a good critical reasoner doesn't use rhetorical techniques of arguing um, as much as possible. That they don't want to rely on the rhetorical skill, like your skill in public speaking or sounding persuasive or charm or any of those sorts of emotional manipulation you don't want to be using those things as a reason to get people to agree with your position you want if if you want your dialectical partner agreeing with you it's because you have good arguments that's what a sincere truth seeker aims for they might argue for a position but they only want people agreeing with it if it's actually right and when you make an argument as a sincere truth seeker part of the attitude with that sincerity is putting out your arguments there to be criticized so <clears throat> you kind of are saying, hey, if this is wrong, I want to know it's wrong. I want to make it as easy and as accessible as possible for you to attack these, this idea if there's a problem with it. I don't want to hide things about it. I don't want to hide its flaws. I want to be as open about it as I possibly can. And the use of rhetoric gets away from that. Rhetoric is, is getting into this danger of just being persuasive rather than having an argument that actually holds water and is convincing. Um, on the on the on its on its own merits rationally, so I'd say that's a good reason to avoid using popular wisdom, to using these sound bites things. But there's another problem with them; they're usually pretty vague, so they're suggestive. 
they don't spell out what's actually the logic of the argument very well and thus they're really hard to respond to because it's hard to evaluate what you actually have on your hands um, something can like a little one-liner can sound really good and um, but you can be like wait a second what what is the logic of that really and then when you actually like kind of carve it out you're like oh that's a that's not a very good argument <laughs> it's like a huge leap in logic there there's it's very open to objection or something like that and that's my uh, another part of my advice with responding to this fallacy is just to ask the person to spell out what they mean by that that's it so when they throw the little sound bite in there you'd be like what, are, what what's the way in which you're taking that as making an argument here can you just kind of spell it out for me like I'm kind of dumb you know, you can kind of do the Socratic thing of being like, oh, I'm I'm ignorant. You're going to have to slow it down for me so I can understand what you're really saying. Um, you don't have to be so, uh, what's the word, um, so coy about it or something like that. But I think just being, like, sincere, being like, I want to take your point seriously, so what do you really have in mind? I want to make sure I got the right idea here that I'm not misinterpreting what you mean by this suggestive phrase. Spell it out for me and then look at that the spelled out version and deal with that the way you would with any argument uh, normally. I think that's a good way to kind of get things back on track. Okay, so now we're going into what I was uh, talking about in the last video lecture. is a very exciting territory. The rebuttal fallacies. These ones I love. These these are some of the, the, the sexier fallacies in the sense of um, the kinds of argumentative mistakes that are um, Oh, more problematic. Um, they tend to be more abusive. Um, they're not just problems of bad reasoning, but they're they're running into issues with how we're supposed to be treating each other ethically in a debate. So that I mean, maybe sexy isn't the right word. Maybe more like these these fallacies are a big deal. In fact, if I um, if I wanted you to know, you know, we're doing like thirty something, thirty plus fallacies here uh, in this material. If there's any fallacies I want you to come away with having a really strong understanding with more than anyone else, any of the other ones, they're all here in the rebuttal category, uh, especially abusive ad hominem and attacking a straw man. Those are the two like most important informal fallacies in my book. Um, so rebuttal fallacy is really important. But maybe uh, when I, I mean... Philosophers some, lately have been throwing around this word sexy, so I'm sorry if I am falling into the into the same pattern here. But I guess if there is a sexy part of this, it's that a lot of the rebuttal fallacies are just really nasty in that they they generally try to make it look like they're following the rebuttal principle when in reality they are totally not. So there's a kind of there's a kind of hypocrisy, there's a sort of deception that's involved here with the rebuttal fallacies um, that makes it even more important to have them on your radar and to be looking out for them and to avoid slipping into them uh, yourself. So again what we've got going on with the rebuttal principle here is um, the sort of responsibility that you have in a debate to anticipate objections that will be brought against your position and then to give actual responses to them. So you know as when we talked about the code before I was saying rebuttal is kind of part two of charity um, because you are trying to anticipate criticisms of your opponent, but these are these are not just like arguments on behalf of their side, but arguments that they could use against you and against your position. And you want them to be serious. You want them to be actually legitimate, relevant, important criticisms of your position that actually pose a significant threat, um, and then to be able to respond, again, to, to reply to them that you've got. That's kind of an extension of the burden of proof principle. So when there when there's a criticism on the table, when there's an objection on the table, it needs to be responded to, and that that's another part of the responsibility of defending your position. As I've said many times before, I think that this is an impossible principle to actually satisfy as Edward has worded it, and I like that. I like that it's impossible. I think there's always room for improvement here, and that we, doing the best that we can and trying to push the envelope as far as we can is the right idea. Um, that there's not a limit to how much charity you should be using, um, but you should do it as much as you can and, and as you have time time for and, and energy for, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so these fallacies are problematic because they m might make it look like they're doing this when they're not really. Okay, um, there's a little category here of counter evidence fallacies. I don't worry so much about this as the um, as a sort of category because we're only going to be really talking about one. 
uh, fallacy from within this category, ignoring the counter evidence. And this is a pretty straightforward fallacy. This, this is definitely one that I, well, here's one thing I wanted to say that I've been meaning to kind of call back to. Remember at the beginning of these videos, I was talking about some fallacies being more general and some of them being more specific. Um, and you want to keep an eye on that. All these rebuttal fallacies are kind of interesting because they all have to do with anticipating criticisms and responding to them. So they're only you only need to have your radar sort of scanning for these things when you're at the point in a debate where people are um, presenting objections or replying to objections. So if that's not happening, then a lot of these fallacies you don't have to worry about. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. You can kind of try to imagine at what point would this would there even be the possibility of this fallacy happening and what kinds of things need to be going on. It's kind of like when we were talking about misuse of a principle and I was saying this fallacy is really only happening in cases of either applying the principle or criticizing a principle. So you can kind of listen for those things happening. Same thing here. All the rebuttal fallacies are going to really only be relevant at these cases of, um, of uh, providing criticism, responding to criticism, anticipating criticism, all that stuff. So um, that's something that makes them a little more specific, but still some of them are pretty general even within that. And especially this next fallacy, um, ignoring the counter evidence, because this isn't specifically about replying to anything. This is um, another one of these sorts of uh, fallacies of omission, like a mistake, like the way we talked about rationalization being a fallacy because it's leaving out relevant um, parts of the debate. This is very, very similar to that arguing in a way that ignores or omits any reference to important evidence unfavorable to one's position, giving the false impression that there is no significant evidence against it. So by not bringing it up, that carries the connotation. It conversationally implies there's nothing there to talk about. There's no criticism or countervailing evidence to the contrary. I mentioned that politicians do this very frequently, <laughs> but then I qualify that quickly to say, well, really, everybody. We do this all the time especially if we're not um, the most sincere in our participation in a debate and what we really care about is winning, then oftentimes we leave um, you know, uh, evidence that paints our position in a bad light off the table, and that's a problem. So uh, we talked about a lot of the ideas that are relevant to this. I don't, I don't want to necessarily make a bigger stink out of this than it needs. Um, but I do want to say here that, you know, just like I was saying a second ago, it's important in to be a sincere participant in a debate, which means you actually want to make your position vulnerable. If there's a problem with it, you want to know about it. You want to lose if your position deserves to lose. That's actually a good result. It's like being a good, it's like good sportsmanship in a sporting event or something. You're like, may the better person be the winner. That's, you know, no dirty tricks kind of thing. Um, let's see what's really the best belief to have. And, it, and eventually, you know, or ultimately, a debate is not about the people having the debate and who is a better arguer or something like that. That's not what debates are about. It's, it isn't a sporting match in that sense. It's about figuring out what are the best ideas, what are the beliefs that are mo most deserving of our agreement. So that's important. And the other thing I want to say here is that with it, with like trying to respond to this ignoring the counter evidence, there's really only one response. To try to be on the lookout for stuff like that and then to bring it up if your opponent doesn't mention it. <laughs> I mean, there's not, there's not much you can do um, other than that. Like I say, that's all you can really do. If your partner doesn't want to engage with that evidence, try to ask them to, for the why. And that basically is inviting them into making an argument about and doing the very thing that they were avoiding doing before. So you can kind of gently nudge them into correcting their mistake by just following up on on addressing um, the criticism that needs to be addressed. So that's important. Um, there, there's another thing that I want to maybe mention about this, this fallacy. I mean, ignoring the, the counter evidence um, is this, it is a kind of act about ignoring or omitting. So this isn't saying that if you just don't know about some counter evidence and so you didn't bring it up, like you're just ignorant to it, that you've done something wrong argumentatively. That you can't. This fallacy would it'd be um, absurd to try to hold people accountable for having perfect knowledge about things that they don't know about. That's not that's not um, a legitimate expectation in a debate. This is just trying to invite you to use your responsibility with what you do know. That if you know about something, 
that is damaging to your position and you don't bring it up, now you've done something bad. This, this is actually really connected with how I was arguing for the principle of charity to have an expanded definition than how Edward defined it on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, where I was saying, I think we have a responsibility that if we, like, remember my chess game metaphor, if I, I see a good move for you, I may not mention it because I want to win the chess game. But if this is a debate in league with, the, with truth-seeking and the principles on the code, then I would want to tell you about it. If I think of an argument that you could use against my position, I want to bring that up. I want to give it to you um, because the point here is not to win. It's to try to figure out what's actually true. Maybe your opponent can help you with charity in, in responding to uh, an objection that you're worried about and you don't have a defense for. That can happen too. Okay. Now on to the ad hominem fallacies. Now, this is one of the ones I was saying is most important. We've talked about ad hominem before. I want to say some more things about it, though, um, get into some more details. And I also want to um, uh, draw another picture here for you because these fallacies are another one of the family fallacies, kind of like begging the question. Um, so you've got the big one here is abusive ad hominem. Am I spelling that right? <laughs> never know. Yeah, that's right. All right, so abusive ad hominem, this is the real general fallacy that ha captures the pattern that all of the ad hominem fallacies have. Okay, so that's like how arguing in a circle was the, the big question-begging fallacy. But then we've got a couple more versions um, of abusive uh, of ad hominem that are a little more specific. One of them is called poisoning the well. And the other one is uh, the two wrongs fallacy. So this is the family of ad hominem fallacies. You just have these three. Abusive ad hominem is the more general one. Two wrongs and poisoning the well, those are the more specific ones. So again, like my advice with all of these, uh, when the ones that have the families of fallacies, maybe figure out um, all the ones that are sort of in that category first that are on the exam figure out the more specific ones, what which ones those apply to, and then the general one you leave for the end that, with whatever's left. That's kind of using process of elimination here. If you do mark something that's in fact two wrongs fallacy as abusive ad hominem, that's correct, so I'll give you credit for that, but now you've used up your abusive ad hominem answer and you're going to have to throw two wrongs as the answer to some other question that it doesn't belong in, um, So, and you'll get that one wrong. So that's how, again, just a reminder about how the exam is going to work and I'm going to grade that. So watch out. Um, all these ad hominem fallacies involve the idea of attacking a person instead of the argument that they're offering. Okay, And when we're, when we're having a, a debate about the truth of something, we want the arguments to decide things, the, argue, the ideas that are being put on the table. We make a claim, back it up with other claims. That's what an argument is. If you start attacking the person who's giving the argument, you're directing criticism in the wrong direction. Okay. Um, it also, so in, in one sense, that's wrong because you're not addressing the argument that's actually been offered. Um, let's go back to that metaphor I've used before for, for debates. Like we come to the, the table of this debate and then I start, you know, taking things out of my bag and putting them on the table. I'm like, I think this is true. I think it's true because of this. And I can defend that with this thing. You know, so you're making all your arguments. You're putting all that stuff out there on the table. The stuff that's on the table that's where the criticism should be directed and that's the principle behind the re or that's the idea behind the rebuttal principle burden of proof principle so if you want to put an idea on the table you need to defend it if you want to criticize an idea you can do that but you have to give an argument behind your criticism as well if you want to say that criticism fails you need to provide an argument for that that's all stuff with the ideas right all the things that we're doing in a debate are about looking at the ideas if you start attacking the person who put the ideas down that doesn't deal with the ideas. Ideas are separate from the people that believe them. Those things can be separated. They're not the same thing. Just because one person believes this thing and maybe they have certain characteristics doesn't mean that someone else who also believes it is going to have the same characteristics. And in any event, the characteristics are not what's important here. There is one exception to this, but I'll, I'll talk about it. So, but the, the one issue is that if you attack the person instead of their ideas, then you're just missing your target. You're not fulfilling your rational... Uh, duty and obligation to try to evaluate the ideas for their merits. It's just, it's like um, 
if actually this is a fallacy, a bigger, an even bigger fallacy than um, abusive ad hominem, which is actually included, that ad hominem is included in, is um, red herring. So we'll, we'll talk about red herring a little bit later, but I'll give you the sneak preview right now. Red herring, the red herring fallacy is if, if we're talking about this and having a debate, a debate about this, and maybe my position's sort of getting weak over here, so I just change the subject to something different. That's not a reply to the concern, right? If I just change the subject, I didn't really respond. I may have said something back, but it wasn't relevant as a way of defending whatever was going on with the issue under debate. That's what's going on with ad hominem. I'm putting some ideas on the table, and you're shifting the attention to me if you're attacking me personally. That's not addressing the ideas. It's not a response. So there's a rational reason why ad hominem is bad, but there's also an ethical reason. To uh, abuse people, to like criticize them directly to launch personal attacks on them is just unethical behavior. Uh, there's concerns about that. And that doesn't mean you can't criticize people in their character. That can be done in a way that's positive and ethical and respectful. But uh, very often, the criticisms that we launch on each other are not done to help each other out or to be respectful or not done in a respectful way. They instead are... Um, done to hurt and abuse, to dismiss people, to push them out of a conversation. Uh, we'll talk about some of those dynamics with some of these fallacies. And that's not appropriate. That's not ethical behavior. That's not two people aligning to try to seek the truth together, like the picture that we've got from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. So the ad hominem fallacies are pretty important because if you remember back on the code, we had those two requirements for the principles on the code. We want rules that if we follow them, help us get at the truth, you know, engage in rational truth seeking, and where we treat each other and ourselves ethically. Ad hominem fallacies are so bad because they're violating both of those things. They're, they're not fulfilling our responsibilities ethically to each other, and they're not even helpful for getting at the truth. I mean, I, sometimes I've seen people make the case to me that it's like, well, it, you know, sometimes truth-seeking, got to break some eggs to make some omelets. Again, that would be fallacy of popular wisdom if someone argued like that, by the way, just a quick example. See, tied it all together. Um, but, I mean, the, the point that these people have sometimes made to me is that truth seeking you kind of got to check your ego at the door, and it can get a little nasty. You know, people are going to attack your position. That's going to happen, and you got to have a thick skin about it, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't think that's an excuse for being abusive and disrespectful to each other. And, in fact, I challenge people who defend this kind of point of view to show me in what way does being calloused, insensitive um, and just sort of rough or rude how that actually adds anything to our efforts to get at the truth okay and that I think it's hard that's a hard sell or I'd say it's a hard sell and I, I welcome if you want to debate this with me it's a very pertinent topic right now I've heard a lot of people talking about um, the debate over um, being politically correct or not or what it means to have freedom of speech this is a very interesting debate you want to debate with me I'm down I'd love to do it you kinda of know where I stand on this um, and if you want to talk about it some more, we can. But even with some of the disagreements there, that could happen, some controversies to resolve there. Um, I don't think that it's asking all that much. Even if, like, say, you and me disagree about um, the ethics around political correctness, we can agree that abuse of ad hominem is not going to get us anywhere, that that's not appropriate. Okay. So... Um, We've been kind of describing what the general pattern here of abuse of ad hominem is. Attacking one's opponent in a personal or abusive way as a means of ignoring or discrediting his or her criticism or argument. That's the problem. Criticizing the person instead of their ideas doesn't actually respond to them. That's a problem. Now, there is one possible exception to all of this. Okay, let's go back to my, my metaphor here of we got the table of the debate. Um, this this makes a this is a much better visual metaphor when I've got um, a classroom with a table and stuff like that. But this, I don't know about the camera. We don't really necessarily have the, enough space here. But just imagine we're coming to the table of debate, putting arguments down on the table of debate. To attack me personally is irrelevant. I'm not on the table of the debate, or am I? If I make an argument from authority, an appeal to authority, we've talked about this argument pattern before. But if I make an appeal to an authority where I cite myself as the authority, that is equivalent to putting myself on the table of the debate. So if I say, take it from me, you can believe it because I believe it, and I'm an authority. Now, 
for you to make judgments about my personal character is totally relevant because I have brought my character into the debate in the sense of I've appealed to it as the argument for why you should believe my conclusion. So if that's happening, now it would be appropriate to make judgments about my character or what's going on with me personally as a part of evaluating the merits of that argument from authority. You can still be respectful about it though. There's still room to be abusive and that wouldn't necessarily help. Okay, So just like insulting me would not uh, really be the best way to make the point punch home about in what ways I don't count as an authority. Right? If you're just like, you're just so stupid or something. I mean, okay, there's a better way that you can make that point if it's relevant to attacking my authority on an issue. But that's the only exception. It's only when a person has placed themselves into the argument that now it would be appropriate to talk about those things. Okay. But otherwise, can't attack the person to respond to their ideas. Got to look at the ideas. Sometimes, I mean, here's the other thing I might say. Another kind of exception case is that if what we're debating is my character, then talking about what's happening with me personally is totally relevant. I mean, if, if we're having a debate about, um, I don't know, like how virtuous Tim Lineman is or something like that, then we'd probably have to look at things about me to make that evaluation. So if I'm the topic of conversation, then it would be appropriate to, to talk about me. <laughs> Again, not in an abusive way, but in a realistic way and maybe a critical way, in a way that um, is accountable. So. So that's the other kind of way in which it could happen. But then that's, again, not to attack the person instead of the ideas. It's like, I disagree with your idea because I don't like you. And that's the thing. That's the last thing I want to really say about ad hominem here, generally. Um, I think the tendency for ad hominem is really huge. And it's not necessarily because um, we're so uh, acculturated into being nasty with each other in arguments, although I think there's a little bit of that going on. Um, it's definitely something to keep an eye on because, I mean, man, the Internet's just so full of ad hominem attacks. When people are debating each other on the Internet, I mean, you're going to see some ad hominem fly for sure, for sure. Uh, only in really um, rare forms do I not see that happening. But the tendency, I think, also comes from how often we really decide whether we want to agree with what someone is saying based on what we think of them. So if, if we like a person, we're more inclined to agree with them. If we don't like a person, then we're going to like stubbornly resist agreeing with them. We're like, I don't want to be on your side. So we confuse character in what people are like with what ideas they have. And like I've said before, I mean, we have to acknowledge that sometimes these things go in the other direction, right? I, I think I've, I've said this, I've described this case before. I said um, sometimes the most uh, frustrating thing about people who are jerks um, is that sometimes they're right. You know, even if they're making the argument in a really jerky way, maybe they're guilty of using ad hominem and all these sorts of other bad argumentative practices. Sometimes they have a point. Like sometimes their ideas actually have merit, even if we don't like the way that they're presenting them. Um, or we don't agree with them as a person, their character as they are as, as, a, as a person, that that could be maybe something we don't want to approve of. They could still make a good argument. Um, I was just talking with one of my friends who um, uh, is a very staunch um, progressive, like a really extremely liberal person. Um, but they were like, you know what, I like some of the things that Trump is saying. Like some of the, the policies that he has for his first hundred days in office, this person who is like normally would be so diametrically opposed to a conservative candidate like Trump because of his progressive position, he still is like, you know, there's a lot of things I don't, I don't necessarily like about the guy or about him as a president, blah, blah, blah. But hey, this point, that's a legitimate point. I see the, argu I see the force of the argument there. That's a really good argument. This is a, this is a policy that should happen. Um, I don't agree with necessarily the rest of this stuff, but I, I can agree with that. And that's kind of what we have to do to avoid ad hominem, is that we have to disentangle our judgments about the person and our judgments about these ideas, or maybe the sometimes we have to discriminate between ideas that get conflated, like we talked about equivocation before, just kind of being subtle and careful about, does this criticism apply to this, or is this just sort of guilt by association here? We can kind of glom things together, or these different things can bleed into each other, and we need to be more discriminating when we're launching our attacks or appraisals of things. We've got to be more careful about it.
And so this is another version of that. You can imagine kind of the opposite. We don't, we don't, I don't have a name for this on our fallacy list, but you can imagine another fallacy that isn't abuse of ad hominem, but it's making the same mistake. And that would be like agreeing with someone, thinking that they're right, because of things about them as a person. So like, it, sometimes we argue this way. We're like, take a look at this person. Aren't they such a virtuous person? They believe this, so you should too. I mean, that kind of, that'd be the same sort of mistake. That'd be evaluating the ideas that someone is offering, not on their own merits, but in terms of the person who is offering those ideas. If we do that, we're going to be much more easily duped too. Being a critical reasoner means separating those issues, being able to look at ideas for their own merits um, on their own. So that's what ad hominem is kind of all about. Now there's a couple more um, versions. Oh yeah, and I also say, don't uh, fight fire with fire. <laughs> that's that's like feeding the troll. Don't do it. Um, if, if someone is using ad hominem, then that's already threatening the conversation being productive. And if you reply in like kind, then you have just killed it. I mean, it's going to be over, done after that point. Um, or eh, maybe sometimes it can be saved, but that's very rare, and it takes a lot of effort to make that happen. So watch out for that. We've got a couple more varieties of how this happens. Poisoning the well and two wrongs fallacy. Let's talk about poisoning the well first. I, I like to describe uh, poisoning the well as kind of like super duper ad hominem. It's like the extreme version of ad hominem. Um, if Think about it like this. I think this is a good image. Because it's, it's going to be really easy to confuse abuse of ad hominem with poisoning the well. So like on the exam, I definitely recommend figuring out the two problems that look like they could fit for either one, and then trying to figure out which one's more on this end of the spectrum versus the other. But if in abuse of ad hominem, you put something on the table of the debate, and I'm like, nope, by launching a personal attack. I'm like, attacking you as an excuse to toss your idea off the table. That'd be abuse of ad hominem. In poisoning the well, I'm attacking you personally, so I am doing abuse of ad hominem, but I'm making a kind of attack on you that not only shoves off the table everything you've said so far, but it also kind of preemptively shuts, keeps you from putting on the table anything more. It's kind of like the idea of poisoning the well is that if I wanted to poison a whole town, I don't have to go around poisoning every single glass that everyone is drinking out of. I just poison the well, everyone gets their water from the well, and so now everyone is poisoned. In other words, I'm trying to paint someone in a light where anything that comes out of their mouth is going to sound bad or wrong or going to get dismissed before they even say it. Um, that's poisoning the well. So when you hear someone, a, a personal attack happening that has this force of kind of pushing a person completely out of the debate, like completely out of the discussion, like you could never have any contributions to offer into this debate. When it's that kind of personal attack, that's poisoning the well. Okay, so it's like it still is the abuse of ad hominem pattern. It's very close to that, but it's it's got this kind of more final and complete disregard for what not only the person has already said, but anything that they could possibly contribute to the debate. I like some of the examples here from the book, um, especially the one uh, about um, the uh, the person who is like, um, or maybe this is even one of the homework problems. Maybe I'm giving you an answer to a homework problem ahead of time, but. Someone goes to a, a Catholic priest, and the Catholic priest is kind of giving them advice about um, how to raise their children or something like that. And they're like, I don't have to listen to you. You don't have any children, so how could you possibly know anything about raising children? Because Catholic priests are always celibate, right? They don't have kids. Um, that would be poisoning the well, because the kind of personal attack that's being made is like completely disregarding the opportunity for anyone to say, for that person, the priest in this case, for making any contribution. Well, really, you should look at the ideas. I mean... The priest could be like, hey, I didn't get this from my experience. I got it from learning from this other person who has a lot more experience than I do. Maybe the idea still has merit. Um, I have uh, an, another kind of example like this um, that hits closer to home for me. I've been interested in um, gender theory and feminism for a very long time. And I have heard the argument many, many times that when I like uh, weigh in on a debate about gender issues or about feminist issues... Um, that I couldn't understand, I couldn't make an argument or contribution because I'm a man. That I can't, uh, and there, there are, it is true that there are certain things I cannot understand because of my experience. 
that I don't see it in the same way or I don't feel it from the inside, that's true. But oftentimes the kinds of ideas that have been discredited that have been contributing to the debate are just kind of like theoretical points that could be that would maybe be considered maybe more favorably by the person who has discredited me, who's used poisoning the well against me, if they had just come out of the mouth of a woman instead of me. Um, and that doesn't do anything to make the ideas better or worse, because that kind of a, a theoretical position is not argued on the basis of authority or just on direct personal experiential evidence or something like that. There's other considerations here that make for better theory or worse theory, um, and it's those ideas and the merits of those ideas that is what we're trying to weigh here. So like I said, I mean, uh, the feminism issue is a little stickier here because there is, there is, if I tried to use my, if I, if I said something like this, I'm like, well, I know all about feminism because I understand the experience of oppressed women. Then I would definitely be in the wrong. Then I'm basically using an argument authority, citing myself as the authority for something I can't have any authority on. So that's, that's, you know, that would be, uh, correct criticism, but that wouldn't be ad hominem anymore because I've made that argument from authority. I put myself on the table, okay? So that'd be okay. But if I'm like, um, I've, I've read a lot of feminist theory. If I'm like citing uh, an argument that is coming from um, one of these other feminist theorists and I'm just sharing that idea, um, that's not ar arguing off of my own authority or anything like that. I'm presenting the ideas of the argument, the evidence for what it's worth, and it should be looked at that way regardless of who's the person who's putting that on the table. So that's the kind of point here. Uh, that's another way in which poison the well often happens too. Things like that, where people are sort of being pushed out of the debate and, and, and having their ideas pushed out of the debate when really what we're here to analyze are the ideas themselves. Okay, so that's poisoning the well. Um, okay, two wrongs is the you do it too fallacy. Rejecting a criticism of one's argument or actions by accusing one's critic or others of thinking or acting in a similar way. I know you're familiar with two wrongs fallacy because uh, we've all been children and children do this all the time. <laughs> they're, um, well, they're doing it too, right? That kind of response. That's the two wrongs fallacy. I really love the uh, example from the book where the father's talking to his son and he's saying, you know, you, you got to be really careful about drinking alcohol it has all these bad side effects and, uh, and these terrible things can happen and addiction, blah, 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 blah. And the son re replies by saying, you know, it's really hard to take you seriously, Dad, with that glass of bourbon in your hand. So it's like the father is giving all this advice about the dangers of alcohol use while drinking bourbon. So what's going on there? Here's how I like to break it down. Maybe I like that example in particular for illustrating some stuff about two wrongs. It might be true that the father is guilty of a kind of hypocrisy here. That the father isn't taking his own advice. Okay, So that could be true. And that's his problem. But that doesn't say anything about it being um, uh, somehow okay for the son to drink just because the father is. Okay, Now the force of this might be like we should have equal rules about what is permissible or not permissible. People should be held equally accountable. And that's fine. But holding people equally accountable doesn't mean letting everyone off the hook if everyone's making the same mistake. Right? It's still a mistake. It doesn't matter how many people are doing it. Like the, the, the pithy line here that I'm trying to avoid because I'm trying to avoid fallacy of popular wisdom, right? Appeal to popular wisdom. But the pithy phrase that I'm sure you've heard before is two wrongs don't make a right. What's that saying is that if one person makes a mistake, one person makes this mistake, and another person makes the same mistake, what do you got? two mistakes. That's it. That's all that's going on here. So if if I'm um, if you're objecting to my position, to something I'm I'm offering my argument or something like that, and I say, well your position is just as guilty of the same mistake, then all that means is we got two bad positions. We've got two positions that are both vulnerable to the same objection. Now there's one exception to this. Again, there's another exception case to be on the lookout for. Oftentimes, especially in philosophical debates, where we've got a couple different theories that we're trying to decide between. Really, where we've got an argument, we're trying to figure out what's the most rationally defensible position, and we've maybe got only so many alternatives. It might be unavoidable that the two theories that are in competition here, there, there's no third option. This wouldn't be a false alternatives case. Let's say it really are only these two options, this way and this way. And both of them have the same problem. 
then the point that is relevant is that neither one of these two positions could say that their theory is better than the other one, that it's the more rationally defensible position by citing the problem that the other one has. So it's sort of like if this one's trying to say, hey, look, this theory's got a problem, so that makes it a little worse than this one. If this one's like, well, hey, you've got the same problem, so that brings it down to the same level, so they're still equal, right? One is not more rationally defensible than the other. That's a legitimate point. It should still be concerning that both of them have the problem, and if there's any other theory that comes along that doesn't have that problem, boom, it's going to be instantly much, much, much better. Um, but that's a very special case. It's a special scenario. Not all debates are working out as this sort of finding the most defensible position on the issue, and maybe it's just that this is a sign that we should be looking for a different alternative. Um, but that's that's the if there is a point it's that one if there's a way in which something that otherwise could look like it's two wrongs is actually a, a decent argument I'd say that's that would be the case that would um, not meet, meet that description an exception case so that's two wrongs again um, poisoning the well two wrongs fallacies are more specific versions of abusive ad hominem and abusive ad hominem is actually a, it's a pretty general broad category here, but it's even within an even broader category of uh, red herring. So um, let's actually talk about red herring uh, next. So I'm going to actually skip attacking the straw man and trivial objections just for a second, just so we can talk about red herring. So red herring is attempting to hide the weakness of a position by drawing attention away from the real issue to a side issue. Okay, and really the best example of this is changing the subject. That's the most blatant issue here. Now, there's some more subtle versions of this that I wanted to illustrate to you, and to do that I'm going to do some more drawing. So oftentimes a debate is, um, it can get kind of complicated. Let, let's say I'm going to draw a picture here. So this is um, this is a person's position, and you know this is the rebuttal stage. So let's say you're, um, there's a objection that's been levied against this position, and and actually I want to do this a little different. Um, let's say this is it, the objection is targeting you know a specific part. Let's actually make it something more central to the position getting attacked. So. Um, you know, here's a, a part of the person's theory. You know, there's a lot of things going on here, but there's one part of it that there's an objection. Um, I'm just going to put objection, which is attacking that part of, of someone's theory. Theory getting attacked here. If the person wanted def to defend against this objection by drawing attention over to some other part of their theory that's doing a good job, that is, even though it's not changing the subject because we're still talking about the same theory, it is changing the subject in as much as if this issue is unrelated to this one, if like bringing up this helps defend against this objection, okay, now that would be relevant. But if it doesn't help, if this is, you know, a completely separate issue that has nothing to do with that part, then what's the point? The, this is this is just distracting attention away from this one. I call this fallacy, red herring fallacy, the ooh, shiny one. It's like we're talking about some issue over here, and it's not looking good for me, so I don't think I'll be able to defend it. So ooh, 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 check out over here. Check out how cool this thing is. This case that I just brought up with the drawing, where you've got a theory that's under attack, and, and they're redirecting attention from one part of theory to the other part, this is one to be especially concerned about because it really, you might, you're, if you're just having your detectors, your detector ear radar alert for changing the subject, like moving to some subject matter that's irrelevant, it won't get triggered. The alarms won't go off because you're still talking about the same subject matter. I mean, you're still discussing the theory. It's still a part of the debate that's going on. It's just not helpful for dealing with that particular criticism. That's the problem. So um, red herring is a... It's, uh, it's a, the, well, the book calls it a fallacy of diversion because it's trying to distract attention away from something that's a weakness rather than acknowledging that and owning up to that. Now, if you said, granted, here, let's go back to the drawing. Grant, I grant it. Yeah, you got me. That's a good objection. That's a weakness to my theory. Let's call that a negative. That's a negative to my theory. Um, but, hey, I still got these other positives to my theory, and maybe I want to try to make the case that 
even though I've got some problems, the positives still make my theory the better theory out of all the other alternative theories that are out here. Maybe you want to do that, and maybe you can defend that. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem is in trying to make it look like you're responding to the objection by bringing up something else. And and this is the problem. I mean, you see this. You see these fallacies show up a lot more when you're talking in a debate, having an an oral version of a debate rather than like writing it out. Mostly because um, in a in a live debate done with your voices, it's kind of like a tennis match, right? One person speaking, the other person speaking. Back and forth we go in the debate. And sometimes it can appear as though just by giving any response, you've, you've responded. By saying anything, they spoke, then you spoke. But it may not have had anything to do to address the issues or concerns that have been put on the table. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, watch the presidential debates, but holy cow, is there so much red herring going on in those presidential debates. They get asked one question, they're instantly going off the rails onto something else. A criticism is brought to bear, and they completely deflect the attention. Um, they twist it around into some other issue. I mean, it's a, it's actually a pretty impressive art and skill that they have of, of how to do that. I mean, it takes a kind of um, improvisational ability to be able to think on your feet and, and redirect attention like that and, and make it so that people don't necessarily see what's going on. Oh, man, those things are hard to watch. So frustrating for me. Um, but that's that's a problem with red herring. Because ad hominem fallacies are attacking the person instead of their ideas, that's distracting attention. It's changing the subject. So that is a red herring fallacy too. So red herring is a really, really general fallacy. It's going on all the time. A lot of things would count as red herring, so you got to watch out for that. All right, let's go back to the uh, two that we skipped here. Attacking a straw man, we've talked about this so many times before. Uh, I, I think you've got a good idea of it, but I do want to repeat... Um, something important to remember about about um, about strong attacking a straw man that there's a couple different ways it can look one the the nastiest way is if you got two people in a debate and one person saying something and then the other person attacks their position but twists up their position into a really stupid cartoon version of it that's really weak and then attacks it that kind of misrepresentation that distortion of someone's position is uh, a particularly nasty version of attacking a straw man. Um, but it's also not even the most common one that shows up. I mean, you see that quite a bit. This is another one of the fallacies I think it's most important to have on the list, mostly just because of how common it is and how terrible a fallacy it is. But this isn't even the most common version of it, I think, that happens. I think the far more common version of attacking a straw man is when I'm just talking. My opponent's not even here. They may not be even, their, their voice may not even be in the conversation. But I bring up my opponents. I just do it carefully. I select only those opponents to bring up that I'm going to talk to that I am confident I can defeat, the weak ones. I go for the low-hanging fruit. Smash it. Here's another. Some people have said, this is true. Ah, that's dumb. You know, you know, some people who disagree with my position argue that, ah, but they're really weak arguments and easy to destroy. That's also attacking a straw man. And I would argue it's almost an even more insidious version of attacking a straw man. Why? Because it looks like you're using charity. You're like, my opponent's not even here. I'm thinking about things from their point of view. I read all sorts of different sources for my news. I take a look at the conservative and the liberal sides. And I'm looking, you know, it's someone kind of looking like they're um, dealing with the issue fairly when they may not be in substance. It just might have the appearance of that instead of the reality. Checking for that reality can be tough. But straw man fallacy gives us the pattern to look for. If a person is only bringing up very weak positions that are easily objectionable, uh, easily objected to or criticized, when there are more powerful theories or versions of that position in the area that could be brought up, then you got a problem. So that's what you can listen for. Um, watch out for both of those versions of straw man. Distorting someone's position or just bringing up opponents that are weak. Um, listen for both of those things. Um, to detect uh, attacking a straw man. So, uh, oh, and you know, since we're reviewing it, I, I would be remiss in, in just assuming that you understand everything about straw man. Um, I would, even though we talked about it before, let's just remember why is straw man so bad? Well, it's because it's really insincere in terms of truth seeking. It's not trying to figure out. It's not trying to test your ideas. 
um, to try to see what merit they have. It's not looking, you're not, you're not presenting your view humbly and modestly, looking for criticism to see, to test it, to see, to make sure it's really right. If you're bringing up these weak opponents, they're not posing a challenge. They're not testing anything. The only way you could really test your ideas is if you put them, you square them off against the very best that the opposition has to offer and see if it still holds water. If it can defeat that kind of opponent, then you really accomplish something. But if you've defeated these weak things and you're just boosting up, you're inflating your ego, I mean, it's just hot air, right? It doesn't, has no substance to it. It is not a real victory. It's not anything to really make you feel more confident about your position just because it can defeat these stupid versions. So um, that's what makes it um, a problem. Okay, uh, trivial objections. Um, let's go back to this kind of picture here. Um, so uh, actually, I'm going to just kind of let's, let's let's erase a bunch of this and start over. Okay. So let's say you're offering a theory, and now I'm going to attack it. Now, uh, the way I, I sometimes like to, you know, we you you just saw the picture that I had for red herring, you know, where you're sort of maybe switching attention within the theory. But a lot of times, red herring is doing this. Whoop! <laughs> it's just like the response is talking about something off the table, something that hasn't been, even been brought up. But with trivial objections, I mean, at the very least you can say about trivial objections is that they're responding directly to the theory in question, or the, the argument or the position that's being evaluated. Um, that at least they're, they're addressing themselves to the theory. But the problem is that, very with trivial objections, is that it's attacking sort of the fringe parts of the theory, the minor details, rather than the kind of core to, that makes this theory have what it has. I remember one of my um, philosophy advisors when I was an undergrad always was like, Tim, you're just you're pulling your punches too much when you're criticizing people. Don't go after the minor details. Go for the jugular. <laughs> that was my my professor's advice. Um, and it's not just because you know you should be ruthless. It's that um, if someone is offering a perspective or an argument, a position that they're defending, then you need to take seriously the main stuff that they're talking about, the core claims. And that's what we want to test. The problem with trivial objections is like just finding, I call this the nitpicky fallacy, because you're just, you're finding a little nitpicky problem with a position and then using that as an excuse to dump the whole thing in the trash. And that's not taking a position really seriously. You're just looking for excuses to dismiss it. If you haven't addressed the core elements that makes that position what it is, um, the things that are maybe its strongest selling points or it's the main points that it's trying to make and you're just quibbling over minor details, then you're not, a, you're not you, even if you're addressing on target something that's been put on the table of the debate, some of that stuff is more important to address than others. Okay? And to take the person's position seriously means to look at the main point. Another thing that we could say about why trivial objections is a problem is that usually if you find some kind of um, minor issue, like a problem here, with a, with a position or a perspective, this is usually pretty easily fixed. Like maybe all it takes is the, the person who's defending this theory is like, oh, you know what, I shouldn't have said that. Let's just chop off, let's just chop off that whole thing. Uh, and um, yeah, that's not, that's not right. Let's just chop that off from my position. But the rest of my theory is still pretty intact. You know, we chopped off part of it, but not maybe, maybe, maybe it's just a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound. It hasn't defeated the position. And with a, just a little bit of charity on the person who made the objection, they could see that and they could deal with that. You know, they they could still they would they couldn't use that as justification for tossing the argument in the trash. Okay. So that's trivial objections. I say this has some problems with other argumentative virtues like relevance. Um, a productive conversation will get to the heart of the possible disagreements or controversy, and the trivial objections, especially if they are easily fixed with charity don't get at that. They don't do that. And and here's also charity. Okay, like I mentioned. Now, here's one thing I do want to say as a reminder about trivial objections. It might be um, what is a minor point in the argument may not be something that the two parties agree to. 
it can be controversial how important or trivial a certain part of a position is. And one person might think, hey, this is a minor issue. Another person might think it's a big deal. Sometimes the minor details, or what look like the minor details, actually make a huge amount of difference. And this happens in philosophy all the time. There's always this kind of balancing act with philosophers. They like to get really intellectually sophisticated. They love to have really complicated theories and split hairs on things and make all these distinctions and, and, and be super smart and stuff, right? And sometimes that's a waste of time. Sometimes it's not getting anything. It's like distinction without a difference, right? You're making distinctions and it's not getting us anywhere. But other times, and I mentioned this with distinction without a difference when we talked about it before, sometimes the minor stuff really does matter and matters a great deal. Um, at the, the this last week of class in my ethics class, we've been doing um, some really abstract, high-level meta-ethical theory about moral philosophy. Really abstract stuff, and it's been a hard sell this week for my students. I've been trying as much as I can in my lectures to help them connect the dots to see how what looks like this tiny theoretical um, hand wringing or or hair splitting thing actually makes a huge difference for what how what's going on with our moral perspective on life and how we go about thinking about what it means to be moral um, what our relationship to morality is sometimes a lot hinges on a little but it takes uh, shouldering a burden of proof to show that that's true and if you and your dialectical partner the person you're in a debate with if you disagree about what's important and what's trivial now you just have that's another controversy that has to be settled with more argument and you can just keep the debate going and so my advice in responding to trivial objections is to um, present kind of your side of this. One of the things I'm saying here is kind of present your case if you're saying, um, look, I think that's a really trivial point. I don't think this is a big deal in my theory. I think maybe maybe there's a problem here. You know, and Maybe I can grant that. Um, but I don't think that this is enough to toss my whole theory in the trash. Make the case for why you think it's not such a big deal, why it would be trivial. Um, and invite your dialectical partner, if they think it's really that significant, to articulate on what grounds they think this error is deserving of tossing the whole theory in the trash. Okay. So try to just um, do something to invite, again, it's like using charity and presenting more opportunity for your dialectical partner to solve to the problem that the fallacy is a mistake in doing. Um, give them, invite them into doing the kind of arguing that would progress the debate in a productive way. So that, that's my main advice. Don't get su super judgmentally or, or uh, you know, accusational about it. You know, just everything that you can do to invite people into sincere truth-seeking, I think that's always the first line of, of approach and response. Okay, we've got just one more fallacy. End it on a light note. Resort to humor or ridicule. Injecting humor or ridicule into an argument in an effort to cover up an inability or unwillingness to respond appropriately to an opponent's criticism or counter-argument. Um, this goes in so many different categories, and I'd say this is a fallacy. Here, I'll draw a picture to help um, illustrate this point. Resort to humor or ridicule is a fallacy, like this is the fallacy, that it isn't like it's embedded in a nesting relationship with other fallacies, it just overlaps with a lot of fallacies. There's a lot of other fallacies that might also count as resort to humor or ridicule. So you got to keep your eye out for that. But this is a pretty common sort of thing. When, when someone is trying to make appeals to humor instead of giving an argumentative response, and that's the key idea, that if they're trying to persuade the audience based on humor rather than argument, then that's a problem. If they're trying to uh, deflect attention away from criticism by using humor, that's a problem. Basically not engaging in the debate uh, and using humor as a distraction, that's this fallacy. So that means it counts as red herring. It's another red herring fallacy. Um, there's a lot that be, could be connected with like rationalization, totally could overlap with rationalization. It could overlap with um, um, oh, what, I just had it. I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, oh, dang. <laughs> Here, just let me pause. Let me collect my thoughts. <laughs> the um, manipulation of emotions. It definitely is a case of manipulation of emotions, too. It's also frequently connected with the ad hominem fallacies. A lot of personal attacks and the really vicious stabs are also done with humor, too. So, 
be careful with that. Remember again on the exam, you can only use each answer once. So you really have to think about like what's the best fit answer for a certain situation. And I, I'm really trying to design the exam so that if you're approaching it that way and you understand these fallacies in principle really solidly, you know, like where the the boundary of what makes this this fallacy and what doesn't make it that fallacy, that you should be able to work it out. That you've got all the clues that you need and I haven't had a lot of bunch of fuzzy cases that are really on the fence on these things or could go either way. So I try to make it that way. But um, some savviness in taking the exam, I've been given some advice and I'll remind you some advice in the video that I put with the exam about how to approach that exam for success, um, well, how, how to put yourself in the best position to do well here. Um, so be careful about that. I still wanted to have this fallacy on the list because I think it's an important one to have on the radar. I wanted to talk about it. Um, we use humor so much as a part of arguing and I think it has its place and it helps to make things, like I say in my lecture notes here, it helps to make things light and um, relatable, uh, especially if there's something that's kind of dry. Like this happens with politics all the time, right? Like how much of our discussions about politics involve comedy? So much anymore. Um, and politics can be pretty dry. I mean, the policies and stuff, it's, it's not always the most entertaining. But man, we have found a way to make politics entertaining. But it, it usually comes at the expense of critical thinking. Um, and that's a problem. Uh, it's really dangerous to use humor as a part of argument if that's going to maybe convince people on grounds of rhetoric, especially if you're very witty, um, rather than through argument. So this kind of goes to a theme we talked about earlier in this lecture. There's a difference between convincing someone on the basis of argument or convincing them on the basis of rhetoric. They're just persuading them, making something look good or sound good without actually seeing what is the evidence to back it up or what's the argument to justify it. And a sincere truth seeker doesn't want to do anything in terms of their behavior in a debate that would get their conversational partner to agree with them for illegitimate reasons. They don't want that. If, I, if I'm sincere in a debate and I'm trying to convince you of something, um, even though I'm arguing for something and I'm saying, I think you should believe this, I don't want you to believe it because I'm just really good at manipulating you emotionally or something like that. I don't want you to believe it on the basis of rhetoric. I want you to believe it if it really does actually hold water rationally, argumentatively. It really is able to support itself. So, so that's the big thing um, that we're worried about here with why even if I'm not being crafty or sneaky or trying to confuse people or something, I might just be like, I need to be careful about use of humor because I don't want that to have. I don't want that to be the result. Um, I'm I'm always. Uh, Sorry, my uh, hard drive ran out of space, so I had to delete some stuff to make more room. Sorry for the break in the lecture here. So I'm saying my concern about using resort to humor or ridicule is for the sake of my audience. Um, I would refrain from using it if I'm at all worried that someone might agree just on the basis of, of my rhetoric or my wit or something like that. Even if I've got it, I shouldn't maybe use it because that might not be the goal that I'm looking for. So I was about to say that I'm always worried about this as a as a teacher because just being a teacher and going into that classroom, being the instructor in that classroom, I already have a kind of um, de facto uh, power or authority, rhetorical influence just in being the teacher, that my voice is different than the voice of a student. So that's something I'm sensitive to. I don't if I say something in that class to my students, I don't want them to agree to it just because I'm the I'm the teacher and I'm the one saying it. Um, I want it to be because the ideas that I'm offering actually make sense. And so sometimes you have to go the extra mile here to be careful about it, to be careful that um, you're helping your the person that you're arguing with to see things based on the merits of the arguments and not just that you're trying to win at all costs, that kind of thing. So uh, be careful about that. Um, before, at the very end here, I just want to do a quick run through of all of the fallacies and talk about whether they are uh, general or specific. So I, this is something I was promising before, and I want to do that, and then we'll close it up, and then th that'll be it. This will be the last lecture. So there will not be a part five uh, uh, lecture for um, the informal fallacies module. So this is it. Um, all right, so let's, let's take a look at the list of all the fallacies. Oh, and by the way, we need, a, we need a code for the video, so here's your code, DESTINY. DESTINY is the name of a board game I just got that's really fun, so I've been thinking about that. So that's your passcode this week, DESTINY. 
All right, here is actually the exam, except it's not the exam. It's just the beginning, it's just the instructions. And it has a list of all of the fallacies. And actually, I'm going to be programming this into Canvas, so you're not actually probably going to see this document, but this is the thing I print out for my students when I do it in class. So here's all the fallacies. Here's everything on the list. Um, and let's just go through them and talk about whether they're general or specific. Abuse of ad hominem, that's general. It's one of the family theories, or the family fallacies, right? There's other fallacies that fall under it. But it is still a little more specific in that it has to do with um, responding to other people's arguments. It's a rebuttal sort of situation. Appeal to common opinion, that's very specific. Appeal to force or threat, specific, but also easily confused with appeal to self-interest, so watch out for that. Appeal to irrelevant authority. I'd say this is about medium size because we are talking about how some of the other fallacies like appeal to tradition are kind of like appeals to authority. It's just treating the tradition as the authority. So appeal to tradition, that's going to be a more spe specific fallacy than appeal to irrelevant authority. But this one's still pretty specific. It's an argument from authority. You only need to worry about it when someone's appealing to some authority as the basis of, uh, of their argument. Um, arguing from ignorance is fairly specific because we're talking just about an absence of evidence um, as the argument that's being made, but this could happen in a lot of different settings. Um, so I'd say that's pretty specific. Arguing in a circle, now that's more general. That's another uh, family fallacy, right? Because we've got other things in this, like um, question begging definition, question begging language, and complex question. Those are more specific versions of arguing in a circle. Attacking a straw man, pretty specific. But again, this could show up in a lot of different contexts. Again, it's going to be more specific because it's going to be another way of, uh, it's only going to be happening in the context of responding to opponents, so that's what you can listen for. Complex question is specific. It's a specific version of begging the question or arguing in a circle. Distinction without a difference, pretty specific sort of problem. Um, but because distinction drawing is so common, uh, you might need to be looking for this in a lot more cases. Um, but it is a specific type of mistake. Drawing the wrong conclusion. Um, this one, drawing the wrong conclusion and uh, using the wrong reasons are the, those are kind of a pair. Remember, we talked about these as being related to each other. They're two sides of the same coin. Both of them are pretty general because they don't have a lot of conditional restrictions on what it takes to be guilty of this. Um, there's a lot of situations that have the opportunity for drawing the wrong conclusion or using the wrong reasons. So these are two of the things that I would say that I would save to the last. Um, they're two of the more really general ones. Equivocation is a uh, pretty more sp more specific, but just like with distinction without a difference, it can happen in so many cases um, because it's a matter of distinction making or lack thereof, and that's happening in almost every argument. Fallacy of composition and division are also a pair that go together. These are a little more specific though because they're talking about parts and holes, so you only have to be worried about them when that happens. Um, fallacy of popular wisdom, pretty specific. You know, listen for those sound bite sorts of things, those little cliched sayings. Fallacy of the mean, very specific, because this is own is a very particular way of making an argument of saying something's a good idea because it's the compromise or the moderate position on something, and that's the only reason that's being offered. So that's pretty specific. False alternatives. Um, this I'd say is medium size because it can show up in a lot of different situations. Um, Anytime, but the, the main thing that makes it a little more specific is that it's uh, you're only going to be really wanting to worry about this when someone is presenting a bunch of different options and they are, are leaving out an important option, a relevant option. Genetic fallacies, um, pretty specific, um, but it's also easily confused with appeal to tradition, so watch out for that. Um, ignoring the evidence is this one is pretty general. This is another one that it could be happening all over the place. Um, so I would I would be I would leave this one till later. Um, is ought fallacy I'd say is medium sized because there are other things that count as is ought fallacy, um, like appeal to common opinion or appeal to tradition. Those would be is ought fallacies. But this is still a particular pattern that you can be looking for, right? You're you're going to be looking for the is ought fallacy only when the person is arguing for a normative conclusion, that is a conclusion about what's good or bad or right and wrong. That's the only time where this, there, there's even the danger of being guilty of this fallacy. Manipulation of emotions is a really general fallacy, very general. Lots of things qualify as it, 
So I definitely save that one for later. Misuse of a principle, pretty specific problems that we're worried about there. Again, appealing to or objecting to a principle is the only time you need to worry about this. Poisoning the well, a more specific version of abuse of ad hominem. Question begging definition and language we already talked about, more specific versions of arguing in a circle. Rationalization is a very, rationalization, red herring, these are really, really general fallacies. Lots of things can count as them, save them for the end. Uh, look at the leftovers, figure out the more specific ones first before putting these down. Resort to humor or ridicule should stick out as a sore thumb because you're looking for comedy. But keep in mind that this could overlap with other cases too. So um, be careful about that. Be really looking here on the exam for some a case where someone is using humor as like a distraction, where they're trying to avoid addressing something or taking the argument seriously by using humor. That's what you really want to listen for. That's pretty specific. Um, trivial objections is, um, this one is is still pretty specific in as much as it's again only going to be, even there's even a danger of it if people are responding to uh, to um, to an argument. They're like making an objection to a, to an, a position or a theory or uh, or an argument and nitpicking at it. So that's going to be pretty specific. Two wrongs is another version of abuse of ad hominem, more specific, um, and then using the wrong reasons we already talked about, um, more general. So that's all the fallacies on the list. And a little uh, quick tips here about which ones are more general, which ones are more specific. When you take the exam, do the more uh, try to identify the more specific ones first. Do not take the exam front to back, one at a time. I highly recommend reading the whole thing first. But I'll, I'll remind you about all this stuff in my exam video when you take the exam. So stay tuned for that. I'll see you then. If you got any questions, please talk to me. I'm here to help. All through finals week, I'm available. So, you know, ring me up, um, get a hold of me, and, and we can do some studying. So I'll see you around.